The question in the mind of the farmer at the end of the film you've just seen is clearly a very interesting one, if, if not important. Has the ice retreated simply to advance again and to bring with it another load, as the farmer put it, or have we seen the last of the ice age? The possibilities, the two possibilities, are very important ones for our culture, for our civilization. They won't affect us, but they may very well affect generations ahead in 50 or perhaps 100,000 years. The two possibilities lead to the following consequences. Either the ice will ad advance and North America, for example, and Northern Europe may be inundated with just as much ice as they were uh, 15,000 years ago, or the ice may continue to melt, the ice and the ice caps of Antarctica and Greenland, raising sea level, albeit very slowly, but nevertheless raising sea level, and some of our coastal cities may be drowned. They're not so very far off in geological terms, one of those two possibilities. Well, in order to answer that question, we need to know something about the origin of ice ages. What causes ice ages? And perhaps right from the start, one ought to say that we really, as yet, don't know exactly what causes ice ages. But there are a number of factors that we do understand that may be part, at least, of the cause of ice ages. And we'll have a look at some of those in the next half hour. Now, first of all, what do we know about climatic changes? Because clearly, glaciation, the advance of ice, has something to do with climatic changes. Well, there's good historical evidence over the last thousand or so years, 1,500 years, of climatic changes which have been quite substantial. For example, between about 400 AD and about 1200 AD, the climate was relatively mild, and there was very little sea ice between Greenland and Iceland. And it's at that time that the voyages of the Vikings took place, because the sea was free from ice. But between 1200 and 1400, there was something of a cooling, and ice became more frequent, and voyages became more difficult, and that's recorded in the Viking sagas. Between 1400 and about 1550, uh, things began to warm up again, but then between 1550 and 1850 came what's often been called the Little Ice Age. Things got very, very much colder. And for example, we can see this in the advance of glaciers in the Alps. The Rhone Glacier, for example, was very, very much farther down the valley than it is in this photograph, which was taken uh, just a few years ago. In this photograph, the glacier is right up on the shoulder of the mountain. But in 1850, at the end of the Little Ice Age, that glacier was way down in the valley, and in fact, it was quite a tourist attraction. And the slight warming up, which has succeeded since 1850 until, in fact, just about 20 years ago, was responsible for the melting back of the Rhone Glacier. Now, as was mentioned also in the film, since 1940, there seems to have been a general cooling down. So we have evidence then from historical records. We have evidence from uh, the Romans, for example, were able to grow grapes in Britain something that uh, the British can't do at the moment. In fact, the most northerly grapes in Europe at the moment are still about 300 miles south of the coast of Britain. So there's a whole complex, a uh, whole multitude of historical observations which go to show that in the last 2,000 years there have been quite major climatic changes which have affected commerce and uh, migrations of peoples from, for example, Iceland to Greenland and so on. Um, another one that's quite interesting, if we can perhaps put that in, uh, the ice was so far advanced during the Little Ice Age that in fact Eskimos were able to land on the northern coast of Scotland. They came along the sea ice, the edge of the sea ice, which was then only a couple of a hundred miles north of Scotland. That's perhaps one of the most astonishing of the, uh, the effects of the, the Little Ice Age. Few people in Scotland would now expect to be visited by Eskimos that came by kayak. But um, enough, of, enough of history. Um, <clears throat> what else do we know about the Ice Ages? Well, we know that the Ice Age, which 
we may just have seen the end of, or we may still be in the middle of, was not simply one great advance of ice from the north and then a melt back um, <clears throat> from t toward, the, toward the north. In fact, we know from studying glacial deposits that there were at least four advances of the ice and subsequent retreats, and we're in one of those retreats. Uh, the ice apparently began to form about two million, perhaps two and a half million years ago. And the first advance lasted until about oh, one million seven hundred thousand years ago. And then following that were, uh, was a retreat and a further advance of ice lasting perhaps three hundred, four hundred thousand years. And then a retreat, an advance and a retreat. So there's a pattern of advances and retreats to the last ice age. And that's an important fact that we must take into account if we're to explain ice ages. Um, <clears throat> another observation has to do with the frequency of ice ages. Is the ice age of the last two million years a normal geological occurrence, or is it something unusual in the history of the Earth? Well, it's relatively unusual. We have means of spotting the occurrence of ice ages in the past, we can recognize the deposits that were left behind by the ice. For example, at Elliott Lake, one of the road cuts that you in the area probably know quite well, is of ice age deposits left behind by a Precambrian glaciation. The rock of this road cut looks like a pudding, a pudding with large pebbles of granite in it, in fact, pink granite. In this specimen, gathered with some labor from that very same rock cut, you can see the granite pebbles and boulders quite easily. The ground mass, which is dark around them, is composed of sand and mud. And that kind of mixture of sand and mud with boulders of various sizes scattered within it is quite typical of glacial deposits. You can see it all around you at the present day, um, around Sudbury and around all of northern Ontario, are quite thick, extensive sheets of that kind of rather messy, mixed up melange of boulders and sand and mud. They were left by the last glaciation, but the specimen from Elliott Lake is not a specimen of glacial debris from the last glaciation, but from a glaciation in the Precambrian. In fact, a glaciation of about 2,200 million years ago. Now, that's one of the first glaciations of which we have a record. There were further glaciations in the Precambrian, one of them about 900 uh, million years ago. And then in the Paleozoic, in the Ordovician, for example, and also in the Permian and the Carboniferous, a glaciation that you remember was evidence of the former union of the continents of Gondwana land. But since that time, since that Permian Carboniferous glaciation on Gondwana land, there were none, or there is no trace of them in the geological record anyway, until we come to our present or just past glaciation of two million years ago. So the conclusion we can draw from that is that Condition 